computer. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Sean. Welcome back to another edition of the 1455 interview. I'm having so much fun with this series already. Um, as you'll see, it's just a great opportunity to uh, take a little bit of a deeper dive behind the cover and see who these writers are, what makes them tick, what their processes are, uh, what they're passionate about, et cetera. And as a reminder, uh, the mission here is to try to ask as many questions as possible in 14 minutes and 55 seconds. So today, uh, I'm very happy to have my friend Tara Campbell. Tara uh, was involved in this summer's Lit Fest. She was involved in a panel there, and she's also a real inspiration to me. She's super involved in the local and, and inter or national literary scene. She's a great literary citizen, and she's a super prolific writer. And as you'll see, as I introduce her via her bio, the titles of her books are amazing. So let me, let me tell you about Tara and then we'll bring her on. Uh, Tara, who can be found at www.taracampbell.com, is a writer, teacher, Kimbilio Fellow, and fiction editor at Barrel House. Prior publication credits include The Smoke Long Quarterly, Master's Review, Monkey Bicycle, Jellyfish Review, Booth, and Strange Horizons. She's the author of a novel, Trevolution, a hybrid fiction poetry collection, Circe's Bicycle, a short story collection, Midnight at the Organ Porium, which received a starred review in Publishers Weekly and is the best title ever, uh, and the brand new uh, collection, Political AF, which stands for AF, a rage collection. She received her MFA from American University in 2019, and she is a rock star. Tara, thank you for joining us. I can't wait to hear your answers. Oh my gosh, well thank you for that lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Well, let's get it on. Um, without <laughs> further ado, I, I know everyone's ready to hear, uh, you know, the secrets of Ms. Campbell. So how about right off the top, the first book that made you want to be a writer or a book that changed your life? Yeah, you know, I was, when I was in junior high, I was obsessed with this science fiction anthology series called the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. And um, the first volume, there were several volumes with different uh, types of works, but the first volume was uh, published initially in 1970 or thereabouts, and it focused on short stories. And the stories ranged from uh, 1920s through the mid 60s. So, you know, catching that golden age of science fiction with all the writers down the alphabet, you know, uh, Asimov, Bradbury, Clark, Heinlein, you know, some who are canceled now. But, you know, they still played a formative role in getting me excited, yeah. um, not just in the genre, but just in the, the prospect of writing a story to begin with and giving my mind free reign. Right on. Okay. Great answer. Um, impossible question. A few of these I acknowledge right up front are in, impossible and that's the whole point. But what would you say, if you could say, is your most profound artistic influence? You know, I would have to say that it's not a person or a book, but it's a question. What if? And I think that kind of dovetailed with my love of science fiction because all of these stories are just about what if. And if you weren't bound to the here and now, you know, you could kind of just see what your brain comes up with as an answer. And so I think that has always been my, you know, when I'm having the most fun with writing, is that what if question. Well, and I think, you know, looking at the diversity of the types of forms that you, you master in, uh, I think that's obvious. And, and I think a lot of people believe, and it's true, that the most important thing for a writer's imagination, I mean, that's undeniable, but I think curiosity Definitely. It's really what makes a lot of us tick in terms of Absolutely. we don't know the answers to some of these questions and we write to explore them. Right. Absolutely. Um, either or an album or movie that you recommend without reservation. You know, um, I thought about both and I can't narrow it down to a specific artist, but for album, I would say any kind of bebop jazz, I think because of that element of structure, but improvisation. Um, and for movie, I always have fun with your sort of, you know, classic sci-fi alien invasion or superhero movie. Um, one that sticks out is Watchmen for mm -hmm. kind of the sense of style, the moral ambiguity, that faded wonder. And of course, the larger question of like, who's watching the Watchmen? You know, it's like adventure, but you think too while you're watching it. This, this is one of the reasons that uh, I admire you, Tara. 
sci-fi and bebop. I mean, <laughs> what more needs to be said? And this was not planned, but I got my Thelonious Monk shirt on. So we're, all right. we're, yeah. we're all about the bebop today. I love it. I love Excellent. it. Um, another impossible but fun one. What would you say is the best first or last line of any book ever? You know, here I'm also sort of bringing in random elements. A line I always keep coming back into, I mean, keep coming back to is actually a line of poetry. Um, Keats's poem, When I Have Fears That I May Cease to Be. Um, I mean, the whole sonnet is a sentence and it's posing this question about life and death and present and future kind of in this fugue state of thinking um, the whole poem is about thinking, but it's so dynamic because I think because of the rhythm, it's that rhythm of a sonnet that's kind of a touchstone of Western, you know, literature. And as much as I am about blowing up the canon, um, it's undeniable that that sense of rhythm is kind of in our, you know, our literary DNA. Um, so that's something that just keeps floating back into my mind. I love it. And, you know, there, there's an added beauty and pathos that he did die at 25. Uh, you just can't right. read that masterpiece now without this tremendous sense of, of sadness and what could have been, but also as always appreciation for what was, but right. thank you for that. I, I adore that poem. Very yeah. important for me too. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, who would you say is one of the most underrated authors in your opinion? You know, I, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to shout out a local author here, uh, Laura Ellen Scott. She uh, teaches at George Mason. And um, I, I think of her book, Death Wishing. I always think of like, uh, it, I was so charmed by that book. Um, it was a quirky premise, but where a lot of authors kind of overplay the quirkiness and, and make you tired of them. Um, mm -hmm. She had this subtlety to her cleverness that I really fell for. Um, there was just this sly, knowing humor to the book that took you through this incredible premise that had real heart to it. Um, so I would say Death Wishing um, and Laura Ellen Scott are, you know, things that I always I have a soft spot for. That's awesome. And that, I, I'm sorry, I have to add that, that, that that's very like you to uh, shout out a local author. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Our local, our thriving local literary community. Absolutely. Um, my obligatory, self-indulgent, <laughs> satirical, well, not satirical, whatever the word, sardonic question. Why have you not read Moby Dick? And if you have, what classic would, do you regret not having read yet? It, he's not a local author. I mean, you know, what am I gonna do with that? <laughs> no, <you> know, <laughs> I always considered myself like lucky not to have been assigned that work because you hear so many people just slugging through it and not enjoying it. And um, I was fortunate in that my school system didn't really have that mentality of like, you know, since I got the whip, you have to get whipped too. Um, but uh, so I never really felt like it was missing from my life. Like it's something I had to circle back and do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just grateful that, you know, I had the kind of instructors that could really, you know, do as much as they could to tailor the work that they thought would be more interesting for their students. It's hard to argue with that. Is there a classic that you have had on your list that you just haven't got around to yet? Um, you know, The Warmth of Other Suns. Mm. That's something that Brick has been sitting on my bookshelf and I know I should read it, um, but I haven't yet, but it's still there. I almost, I put it to the pile to give away because I thought, let's be realistic. I'm like, no, I can't, I can't. I returned it to my aspirational reading pile. So I will at some point read that book. And, you know, every time I do one of these, one of the authors gives me an idea to either add a question or have an entirely other series. The <laughs> aspirational reading pile, that could be its own podcast. What, oh, absolutely. Every writer take a picture of <laughs> either the pile or the piles of books to be read. Right. Which uh, pile has not crushed you in bed yet, you know, on your, on your nightstand. <laughs> <laughs> the story of our lives. Oh, absolutely. Um, okay. This is a tough one, especially because, you know, you're so, you, you're so diverse and you, and you really kind of, move around, but do you feel like there's a particular theme or, or idea that your work uh, addresses? You know, um, this relates more to my uh, political work, the, the political AF book that came out most recently. Um, and if there is a theme, um, it's usually one of fairness, or in that case, you know, injustice. And that really just evokes this strong emotional reaction. I think most people have like a an intuitive sense of fairness, and even if their lives don't allow them to honor it, 
um, there's a, a, you know, a desire to have honesty in life and that golden rule and, you know, do unto others. And, and so I think if there is a theme to work, I'm, that's kind of something that, that turns in my head quite often um, as a problem. It is, it's, I mean, it's been a problem as long as, you know, humans have been humans. So. Yeah, and I would imagine, right, it's not a stretch, like uh, there's a lot of politics in sci-fi or the impulse exactly. for uh, the politics of, of exploring why aren't we where we should be. So right. that, that really makes sense to me as, as a fan of your work that you would say that. So, and by the way, I, the, one of the many reasons I'd never be a good talk show host, I blew my shtick, but I did set the timer. <laughs> so we are on the clock. I forgot to, you know, do my little signature, but we're, we're rolling. All right. Um, Okay, how about writing routine? Do you believe in them? Do you have one? You know, I have one just because it's what works for me, but I don't believe in routines as like a prescriptive or as like advice for all writers. Mm -hmm. But generally, you know, when I'm in my groove, um, I tend to write in the mornings because that's when I'm the most alert and productive. And then in the afternoons, I'll edit. And some people hate editing, but I love editing because that's where you work all the shit out. Sorry if I wasn't supposed to say that. But anyway, um, so, you know, that can be really productive as well, but it's not as taxing for me as generating new work. Um, and then late afternoon, when I still want to be productive, I'll read, I'll get inspired by other uh, authors' work and like dream up new classes to teach. And also look for markets for submission um, yeah. because I don't usually write things for a specific call. I write what's in my head, but then I have to find the, the puzzle that this piece goes into. So that's, you know, what I can uh, still feel productive doing in the late afternoon. Good for you. That's a great system. And, you know, for, for aspiring or younger writers listening, Tara just kind of hit on the key things, right? You've got to get the work done. You have to fall in love with editing or you're not going to last <laughs> and being inspired by other writers reading all the time. And also, you know, making, seeking the marketplace for your work, part of the job. That is a, that is part of all of our work. So it's the kind of the complete package. Yeah. I how, how do you manage to be so productive? So. Duh. Well, it's okay. <laughs> now it's obvious. Um, Okay. Um, how about writer's block? Do you believe in that? Have you ever suffered it? What do you think about that? Oh, I mean, I don't care if I believe in it or not. It believes in me. It comes to visit me quite often. Um, and I mean, just on a, you know, a bit of a serious note, I mean, during this time of pandemic, a lot of people are suffering, just knocked off, off their game. Um, so for me, teaching was a wonderful path out of that malaise. Um, because I could still read and be inspired and want to share uh, stories and techniques and authors with other people. And that kind of helped me concentrate and still feel like I was being productive, even if it wasn't my own words. And that really kind of gave me the structure to come out of that fog and then start doing my own work again. That's so inspiring. And I think, right, the, the key word that we all want to avoid, whether it's our political, you know, acumen or our writing agenda is apathy. And you just can't allow right. apathy to, to beat you. Absolutely. Uh, so by yeah. any means necessary, we cannot become apathetic. Yeah, just keep it moving forward and not telling yourself this isn't the right way to move forward. Moving forward is the important part. Writers have to be like sharks, right? You keep moving or you, or you perish. <laughs> I mean, kind sharks, but yeah. yes. <laughs> sharks with glass, like nerdy sharks. Right, nurse sharks, maybe, you know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, so how about a, uh, a, a particular setback, whether personal or artistic, that, that helped shape your trajectory? Yeah, you know, I mean, this obviously is not an easy question, but this, uh, it made me think about um, when I was working in admissions, when I was still like had a professional job, you know, mm -hmm. um, I was up for a promotion, I was competing for a promotion, and it's something that I really wanted, I thought it really made sense for me, um, in terms of the work I had already done, and my knowledge, my skill base, I thought I was ready for it. Um, but then I didn't get the promotion and obviously, I mean, that's a huge ego blow, yeah. but it also kind of derailed my plans for, Hey, if I have more income, maybe I could buy a place, you know, and like be an adult. <laughs> and, um, but then, you know, when you look back, you realize I wasn't telling the hiring committee what they wanted to hear because I knew they wanted to hear that I was the silver bullet 
that I was the answer they needed, that I was going to want be the one who's going to be aggressive and sales oriented, which, you know, is part of admissions work. Um, but I knew I couldn't do that sort of with any integrity because I didn't want to promise a person that I wasn't. And so, you know, yeah, I, I could sort of live with that decision because it was honest. And it kind of helped me realize that, you know, I'm not really happy in this field um, because of that sales element. And so it made it easier for me to move forward and eventually embrace writing and teaching as a, a full-time thing, because that's where I felt more at home and more um, authentically myself. Right on. And your, your readers and students are grateful that uh, things turned out the way they did. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, well, so this kind of, this is kind of dovetails that how, br as briefly as possible, how would you describe how you developed your career? Yeah, um, gradual and diversified. Um, for me, it was about wanting to just be more um, knowledgeable about my field. Um, and I found that in the long run, it has worked out just that curiosity and that, um, you know, just being, uh, being myself and, and, and not trying to sort of hold myself up to someone else's yardstick. It's hard as a writer yeah. because you see yeah. people out there with all this amazing news and you're like, wait, why not me? But, um, you know, it's just taking the long view and doing it for the love of the craft and the love of the community. And I think that has, you know, really helped me feel good about where I am, no matter where that is. That's great. That's very refreshing, too. Um, I, I can relate, but I, I appreciate that. Um, so similarly, and kind of almost like expanding on that, how would you define or explain what literary success means to you? Um, I think it means two things for me. One, feeling secure, calling myself a writer and a teacher, yeah. um, because imposter syndrome is real, right? Yeah. Um, and that part of success is also predicated on um, being part of a literary community, like really genuinely feeling like part of a literary community. And today, I mean, look, that's going on virtually. Um, and I think we have come to discover that community is not just what's right in front of you physically, but it's those people that you commune with, that you have something in common with, and that you're always glad to see come up in your social media feed or through your email box or what have you. Um, so those two things, just kind of feeling secure in my identity and in my community, um, that's what success has meant to me. That resonates so powerfully. Oh, um, oh, there we go. <laughs> it's, it's a combination, right, of there's no secret answer, but there's, you've got to get the work done. But I think a lot of writers, and, and I, I fell into this category for too long, um, I focused too much on the work and really kind of forgot or lost the, the importance of community and, and that solidarity. And what, what I think a lot of us find is it's inspiring and we lift each other up. It's not competition and it's not a zero sum game. Um, Absolutely. And, and you, I mean, I, I, I'd love to be able to tell you, you know, live and into your face, like you epitomize that. You're, you're, a, you're an active oh. advocate um, and it, it's greatly inspiring and appreciated. Um, the timer went off, but I always reserve the right to make sure the last question, uh, which, <laughs> Not necessarily the most important one, but we always want to leave on this note, a one-ish minute exhortation for a beginning writer that's looking for advice. You know, I think um, what you were just saying uh, dovetails into my answer, um, which would be write first, then market. Um, because, <clears throat> pardon me, I hear so many emerging writers ask about finding agents you know, whether or not to hire a publicist before they've even finished a book. And, you know, I get that because you want people to, you know, experience your art with you. And it feels good when people write about or, you know, write about reading you. Um, but that's really putting the whole venture backward. And it can be uh, a recipe for long term, uh, you know, dissatisfaction with where you are as a writer. Um, because whether it sells or not, if you're a writer, you have produced that work and you have accomplished your goal. And there's so much good content out there that if you make sales uh, and clicks and tweets your metric, then it's just a recipe for unhappiness, you know? Whereas if you focus on the work and, you know, getting that work done, which involves critique groups. I don't know how you can put a book out there and not have it critiqued. And, you know, that doesn't have to take the, the shape of an editor that you hire. 
In fact, I really love, you know, having um, other writers play a role in my work and playing a role in other writers' work. And so, you know, community is part of that process. Sure. Um, and you know what? People talk about writers that they know and writers they respect and whose work they love. And that's how community can turn into your market, right? Very organically and um, sustainably. Um, so that for me, like write first and then worry about all the rest later. Well, that's, in my opinion, that's the kind of wisdom that only comes from experience and uh, your track record validates that. Um, folks, if you haven't checked out Tara, let me repeat www.tara, T-A-R-A, Campbell, C-A-M, P-B-E-L-L.com. Go check out her site, check out some of her work. You're going to fall in love and your vistas will be expanded accordingly. Um, Tara, you're a great friend to 1455. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to call you a friend and I appreciate your taking the time to chat with us. Uh, this was awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate that all that you're doing to keep us together um, with the conference and the center and, and you know, chats like these um, because we're in it for a bit of a long haul. So I'm so yeah. glad that you're here, like keeping the community together and keeping us inspired. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, to a certain extent, it's a labor of love and it's also very selfish. There's nothing I would rather do than, you know, shine a light in any way on, on great authors and keep this dialogue going and, and, and just talking about literature. Like what more, what, what better fun is there than to geek out on the stuff we love? hundred <laughs> percent. Thank so, you so much. So we'll see you again soon. Um, uh, but in the meantime, keep writing, stay well. And, and again, thank you for, thank you for dropping in and dropping knowledge. All right. Thank you so much. All right, Tara. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.